Dr. John D. crouched in the back of the car and attempted, not entirely successfully, to control his temper. The air was heavy with the odor of sulfur, and thin tendrils of yellow-white fire crackled around his fingertips and puddled on the floor. He had failed, and while his masters were particularly patient, they often instigated plans that took centuries to mature, their patience was now beginning to run out, and they were definitely not known for their compassion. Unmoving, held by the warding spell, Penelope Flamel watched him, eyes blazing with a combination of loathing and one might even have been fear. This is becoming complicated, Dee muttered, and I hate complications. Dee was holding a flat silver dish in his lap, into which he had poured a can of soda, the only liquid he had available. He always preferred to work with pure water, but technically any fluid would do. Crouched over the dish, he stared into the liquid and allowed a little of his own auric energy to trickle across the surface as he muttered the first words of the spell of scrying. For a single moment, there was just his own reflection in the dark liquid. Then it shuddered, and the soda began to bubble and boil furiously. When the liquid settled, the image in the bowl no longer reflected Dee's face, but showed a curiously flat image rendered in shades of purple-gray and greenish-black. The viewpoint was close to the ground, shifting and moving with sickening rapidity. Rats, he de-muttered, de thin lips curled with distaste. He hated using rats as eyes. I cannot believe you let them here, Scatty said, shoving handfuls of clothes into a backpack. Nicholas Flamel stood in the doorway of Scatty's tiny bedroom, arms folded across his chest. Everything happened so fast. It was bad enough that D got the codex, but when I realized there were pages missing, I knew the twins would be in trouble. At the mention of the word twins, Scatty looked up from her packing. They're the real reason they're here, aren't they? Flamel suddenly found something very interesting to stare at at the wall. Scatty strode across the small room, glanced out into the hall to make sure Sophie and Josh were still in the kitchen, then pulled Flamel into the room and pushed the door closed. You're up to something, ain't you? She demanded. This is just more than just the loss of the codex. You could have taken D and his minions on your own. Oh, don't be so sure. It's been a long time since I fought Scatchats, Flamel said gently. The only alchemy I do know is to brew a little of this Philosopher's Stone potion to keep Pranelli and myself young. Occasionally, I'll make a little gold for the odd jewel when we need some money. Scatty coughed a short, humorless laugh and spun back to her packing. She had changed into a pair of black combat pants steel-toed magnum boots, and a black t-shirt, over which she wore a black vest covered in pockets and zippers. She pushed a second pair of trousers into her backpack, found one sock, and went looking for its match under her bed. Nicholas Femel, she said, her voice muffled by the blankets, you are the most powerful alchemist in the known world. Remember, I stood beside you when we fought the damn informal, and you were the one who rescued me from a dungeons of Ankorthanak, and not the other way around. She came out from under the bed with the missing sock. When we were the Roska were terrorizing St. Petersburg, you alone turned them back. And when Black Agnes raged across Manitoba, I've watched you defeat her. You alone faced the Night Hag and her undead army. I've spent more than half a millennium reading and studying the Codex. No one is more familiar with the stories and legends it holds. Scatty stopped suddenly and gasped, green eyes widening. That's what this is about. She said, this has to do with the legend. Flamel reached out and pressed his forefinger to Scatty's lips, preventing her from saying another word. His smile was enigmatic. Do you trust me? He asked her eventually. Her response was immediate. Without question. Then trust me, I want to, you to protect the twins and train them, he added. Train them? Do you know what you're asking? Flamel nodded. I want you to prepare them for what is to come. And what's that? Scatdatch asked. I has no idea, Flamel smiled, except that it's going to be bad. We're fine, Mom, honestly, we're fine. Sophie Newman tilted the cell phone slightly so that her brother could listen in. Yes, Perry Fleming was feeling sick. Something she ate, probably. She's fine now. Sophie could feel the beads of sweat gathering in the small hairs at the back of her neck. She was uncomfortable lying to her mother even though her mother was so wrapped up in her work that she never bothered to check. Josh and Sophie's parents were archaeologists. They were known worldwide for their discoveries, which had helped reshape modern archaeology. 
they were among the first in their field to discover the existence of the new species of small hominoids that were now commonly called hobbits in Indonesia. Josh always said that their parents lived five million years in the past and were only happy when they were up to their ankles in mud. The twins knew that they were loved unconditionally, but they also knew that their parents simply didn't understand them, or much else about modern life. Mr. Fleming is taking Perry out of their house in the desert, and they asked us if we would like to go with them for a little break. We said we had to ask you first, of course. Yes, we spoke to Aunt Agnes. She said so long it was okay with you. Say yes, Mom, please. She turned to her brother and crossed her fingers. He crossed his, too. They had talked long and hard about what to say to their aunt and their mother before they made the calls, but they weren't entirely sure what they were going to do if their mother said they couldn't go. Sophie uncrossed her fingers and gave her brother a thumbs up. Yes, I've got time off from the coffee shop. No, we won't be a bother. Yes, Mom. Yep. Love you too, and tell Dad we love him. Sophie listened, then moved the phone away from her mouth. Dad found a dozen pseudocarpiologists sharp eye in near perfect condition, she reported. Josh looked blank. A very rare Cambrian castration, she explained. Her brother nodded. Tell Dad that's great. We'll keep in touch, he called out. Love ya, Sophie said, cutting the conversation short, then hung up. I hate lying to her, she said immediately. I know, but you couldn't really tell her the truth, now could you? Sophie shrugged. I guess not. Josh turned back to the sink. His laptop was perched precariously on the draining board next to his cell phone. He was using the cell to go online because, shockingly, there was no phone line or internet connection in the dojo. Scatty lived above the dojo in a small two-room apartment with a kitchen at one end of the hall and a bedroom with a tiny bathroom at the other. A little balcony connected the two rooms and looked down directly onto the dojo below. The twins were standing in the kitchen while Flamel brought Scatty up to date on the events of the past hour in her bedroom at the other end of the hall. What do you think of her? Josh asked casually, concentrating on his laptop. He managed to get online, but the connection speed was crawlingly slow. He called up Alta Vista and typed in a dozen searches of Scathatch before he finally got a hit with the correct spelling. Here she is. 27,000 hits for Scatchath. The shadow or the shadowy one, he said. Then added offhandedly, I think she's cool. Sophie picked up on the too casual tone immediately. She smiled broadly and her eyebrows shot up. Who? Oh, you mean the 2,000-year-old warrior maid. Don't you think she might be a little too old for you? A wash of color rose from beneath the neck of Josh's t-shirt, pinging his cheeks bright red. Let me try Google, he muttered, fingers rattling across the keyboard. 46,000 hits for Scatdatch, he said. Looks like she's real, too. Let's see what Wiki says has to say about her. He went on and then realized that Sophie wasn't even looking at him. He turned to her and discovered that she was staring fixedly through the window. There was a rat standing on the rooftop of the building across the alley, staring at them. As they watched, it was joined by a second, and then a third. They're here, Sophie whispered. Dee concentrated on keeping his lunch down. Looking through the rat's eyes was a nauseating experience. Because of their tiny brain, it required a huge effort of will to keep the creature focused, which, in an alleyway filled with rotten food, was no easy task. Dee was momentarily grateful that he had not used the full force of the scrying spell, which would have allowed him to hear, to taste, and, this was a terrifying thought, to smell everything the rat encountered. It was like looking at a badly tuned black and white television. The image shifted, pitched, and lurched with the rat's every movement. The rat could go from running horizontally on the ground to running vertically up a wall, then upside down across a rope, all within a matter of seconds. Then the image stabilized. Directly in front of D, outlined in purple-tinged gray and glowing in grayish black, were the two humans he had seen in the bookshop, a boy and a girl, in their mid-teens perhaps, and similar enough in appearance for them to be related. A sudden thought struck him hard enough to break his concentration. Brother and sister, possibly. Or could there be something else? Surely not! He looked back at the scrying dish and concentrated with his full will, forcing the rat he was controlling to stand absolutely still. D focused on the young man and woman, trying to decide if one was older than the other but the rat's vision was too clouded and distorted for him to be sure. But if they were the same age, that meant they were twins. That was curious. He looked at them again and then shook his head. 
They were humans. Dismissing the thought, he unleashed a single command that rippled through every rat within a half mile radius of the twins' position. Destroy them. Destroy them utterly. The gathering crows took to the air, cawing raucously, as if applauding. Josh watched open-mouthed as the huge rat leapt from the roof opposite, effortlessly bridging the six-foot space. Its mouth was wide, and its teeth were wickedly pointed. He managed a brief, Hey! and jerked away from the window, just as the rat hit the glass with a furry, wet thump. It slid down to the alley one floor below, where it staggered around in stunned surprise. Josh grabbed Sophie's hand and dragged her out of the kitchen and onto the balcony. We've got a problem, he shouted and stopped. Below them, three huge golems, trailing flaking dried mud, were pushing their way through the wide open alley door. And behind them, in a long sinuous line, came the rats.